My name is Dr. Supriti Besborough. I'm an independent consultant on gender and development issues, and I will be your moderator for the first part of this forum. First of all, thank you to all of you from across the region for joining us today. We are very happy to have with us over about 100 registered participants, and I can see that about 60 have already joined us, including representatives from a variety of organizations, including the ASEAN Ministerial Meeting on Women, ASEAN Committee on Women, ASEAN Commission on the Promotion and Protection of the Rights in, of Women and Children, ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, ASEAN Women Entrepreneurs Network, and SOMSWAD, UNFPA, ASEAN Confederation on Women's Organizations, Weaving Women's Voices in ASEAN, Help Page Network members from Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, Myanmar, and Indonesia, the Singapore Alliance of Women in Aging, Asian Development Bank, and Oxfam. So we really have a breadth of government, multilateral organizations, and civil society here with us today. So thank you again. Um, before we start, just a few housekeeping issues. We will be having a very... Sorry. We will be having a very short Q&A session during the, uh, at the end of each session. And so if you wish to, if you wish to so give any, submit any questions during the session, please do so with the Q&A button that you can see at the bottom of your screens. Please do not use the chat button to submit the questions. The chat button is there for you to help communicate with all the other panelists and attendees. Um, also, to let you know, the session will be recorded and the recording will be shared with you at a later date. Now, coming back to the reason why we're all here today, the, forum to, the aim of today's forum is to highlight the vulnerabilities of older women during the COVID-19 pandemic. As everyone gathered here today is only too aware, the pandemic has been an unprecedented global crisis. But it's not just a health crisis. In the words of the United Nations, it is a human, social, and economic crisis. And while the virus indiscriminately infects everyone, young or old, rich or poor, men or women, what is actually of grave concern is that the impact is felt differently by men and women. Older women in particular are especially vulnerable. As most of you may already know, older women already tend to have lower levels of financial security. Consequently, the position of older women has become even more precarious during the pandemic. Last year in 2019, the Regional Forum on Social Protection Policy focused on elderly women and aging, underlined the need for older women to become more visible in policies and programs. With the pandemic now, this has become extremely critical. More recently, the joint statement of ASEAN ministers responsible for social welfare and development echoed these concerns and recognized that there's a really a pressing need to ensure the protection and welfare of older women. So the objective of today's forum is really to pick up on these issues and take this conversation further. We hope to end with a set of call for actions that can be shared with all ASEAN bodies. In terms of how the forum is structured, we're going to be dividing the forum into three main themes. First, we will share what we already know in terms of data on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and review the current status in social protection and older women as outlined in last year's regional forum. Then we will discuss current policy responses from different organizations from a gender and age sensitive lens, hearing from representatives of the United Nations, civil society and ASEAN. Finally, we will discuss potential policy responses and ways forward. I'm very happy to say that these topics will be discussed by an eminent set of panelists, all renowned experts in social protection, gender, and older persons. I will be introducing each of them in turn, but before we do so, and before we kick off the proceedings, it is a great privilege for me to introduce His Excellency Kung Kwak, Deputy Secretary General of ASEAN for ASEAN Social Cultural Community, to deliver the welcome address. Before assuming this role at the ASEAN, His Excellency had an illustrious career with the Royal Government of Cambodia. He's a Grand Cross of the Royal Order of Cambodia, and His Excellency also co-founded the Cambodian Institute for Strategic Studies. So with such expertise and knowledge, it is indeed, we are indeed honored to have His Excellency join us today. So without further ado, may I please request His Excellency Kung Pua to address the participants. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Supriti, for your kind uh, introductions and uh, good afternoon to all representatives of ASEAN sectoral bodies, distinguished panelists, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to uh, South Foundations and Help Age International 
for co-organizing these regional forums in collaboration with the ASEAN Secretariat. Our discussion today under the themes of COVID-19 response, gender and aging focus has come at the most opportune time. COVID-19 is a global health crisis with significant human costs that are rapidly rising. The numbers of COVID-19 cases in ASEAN is currently nearing 150,000 with, un with uneven spread of infection among member states. The risk of this virus for older persons are alarming with mortality rate increasing rapidly with age, especially for those with underlying chronic condition. Various study indicated that approximately 80% of people who died from the virus were over the age of 60, with as high as 75% had pre-existing condition. The aging society in ASEAN is growing rapidly, with women comprising the majority of around 60% of older persons in ASEAN. As such, it has become increasingly important to understand and plan for the implication of such trend. This has become more salient in times of COVID-19 pandemic. Social and physical restrictions brought about by the pandemic have aggravated existing economic and social challenges faced by elderly women. These challenges are, among others, high fertility rate, exacerbated poverty, intersecting discrimination, neglect and abuse, loss of income and access to social protection coverage, such as unemployment benefit, health insurance, and pension. In almost all ASEAN and all Southeast Asian nations, a majority of the elderly, ranging from 60 to 80 percent of old people, live with their family members. Challenges arise from coping with the demand for long-term care of older adults, which heavily rely on female family members for care. In spite of this arrangement, elderly women in low-income households have the greatest unmet needs. The pandemic has increased their risk to physical and mental health suffering in the forms of depression and loneliness, while at the same, these elderly women are facing the increasing burden of care work and risk of abuse and neglect by family members. ASEAN has exhibited solidarity through its collective action in tackling the outbreak. The ASEAN leaders provided strategy policy guidance through the declarations of the Special ASEAN Summit on Coronavirus Disease 2019, adopted in April 2020. The declaration in its very tenet called for a multi-stakeholders, multi-sectoral and comprehensive approach to effectively respond to COVID-19. Various sectors of ASEAN have embraced and continue to adhere to such approach, including through the conduct of the special meeting on mitigating impacts of COVID-19 on vulnerable groups in ASEAN on 10 June 2020, which resulted in the joint statement of the ASEAN Ministerial Meeting on Social Welfare and Development on mitigating impacts of COVID-19 on vulnerable groups in ASEAN. Aside from political will and commitment, ASEAN tirelessly endeavors to develop concrete policy recommendations. This includes the finalization of the Regional Plan of Action to implement the Kuala Lumpur Declarations on Aging, empowering all persons in ASEAN with specific articulation on gender perspective, as well as the conduct of the second phase of the Regional Forum on Social Protection Policy, focused on elderly women and aging, led by the ACW and SOMSWAT, in collaboration with other relevant ASEAN sector bodies and partners. ASEAN, in collaboration with partners, continue to share key learnings and best practices, as well as provide policy guidance to improve social protection measures and to strengthen social work, particularly policy and program responses that target older women. Again, this backdrop, we are reminded of the common values and principles that underpin our commitment to leave no one behind. It is pivotal that we do not lose sight of the vulnerable groups, particularly elderly women, who were hit hardest by the pandemic as countries move forward in responding to and recovering from COVID-19 and building resilient to face future challenges and crisis. Let me conclude by expressing my high hope that this forum will arrive at effective and concrete gender equitable and age sensitive policy recommendations an action to mitigate the impact of the pandemic on gender and aging. It is through our collective strength and solidarity that we will realize the people-centered, people-oriented, and inclusive ASEAN community. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Your Excellency, for that excellent back background and backdrop to the situation of COVID-19 and older women in the ASEAN community. Uh, your comments will provide a very useful framework and a guidance for our discussion later today. And as you bear in mind your th thoughts and your urge that we should leave no one behind, and in particular, make sure that we ensure vulnerable groups like older women are included as we move forward towards looking at an inclusive and sustainable community. So thank you very much. With these comments in mind, we can now move on to our first session of the afternoon, which will be followed by a very brief Q&A session. A gentle reminder to all participants, while you're listening, if you have any questions, please do submit your questions through the Q&A button that you can probably see at the bottom of your screen. Now, we are honored to welcome for our first speaker of the afternoon, Mrs. Keng Sambada, the Vice Chair of the ASEAN Committee on Women. Her Excellency is already well known for her commitment to gender issues. She has a distinguished career with the gov Royal Government of Cambodia and has also previously worked at the Asian Development Bank, UNICEF, and the Central Committee of the Women's Association of Cambodia. Today, Her Excellency will review the objectives and key outcomes from the Regional Forum on Social Protection Policy focused on elderly women and aging held in Brunei in 2019. She'll also elaborate briefly on how gender and aging are articulated within ASEAN's work on gender equality and empowerment of women. Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining us today. May I please welcome you to start your presentation. Excellency Kinko, uh, representative from the ASEAN sectoral bodies, UN agencies, the ASEAN Secretariat, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the ASEAN Committee on Women, ACW, I would like to congratulate the Health Age Star Foundation and the ASEAN Secretariat for jointly convening this very important event. I would also like to express my appreciation for extending an invitation to the ACW to share updates on the outcome document arising from the Regional Forum on Social Protection for Elderly Women and Aging, which was held last year in Brunei, Jerusalem. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the world population is aging and virtually every ASEAN member state is experiencing growth in the number and proportion of older persons in their population. The challenges arising from aging population are increasing old age dependency ratios across the region and fiscal constraint in providing social pensions and care. Other related issues include how to transform aging into a new source of social economic development. Furthermore, the feminization of aging also has the potential to become one of the biggest challenges to gender equality of this century. Supporting the ASEAN Ministerial Meeting on Women, AMMW, for the past couple of years, the ACW has been the lead in promoting gender mainstreaming in ASEAN member states and across the three ASEAN pillars, espouse gender equality and gender sensitivities and enhance regional and national initiatives to improve the protection and empowerment of women, especially those in vulnerable situations. Next slide, please. In collaboration with relevant ASEAN bodies, and with the support of the ASEAN Secretariat, the ACW has contributed some remarkable achievements under the ACW Work Plan 2016-2020, such as Senior Official Conference on Gender Mainstreaming in Three Pillars, International Conference on Women Leaders' Voice in ASEAN, Regional Meeting on the Elimination of Gender Stereotypes and Sexist Languages in Education Materials. And the latest event, it was the Regional Forum on Social Protection Policies focused on elderly women and aging, which was held in 2019 in Brunei, Jerusalem. Next slide, please. As the ACW is preparing to conclude its five-year work plan in 2020 and developing the new work plan for 2021-2025, the ACW is moving forward towards recognizing diversity of women and girls 
and addressing their different needs, agencies, and experiences as its priorities for the next five years. There are seven proposed thematic areas that have been identified by the ACW during the visioning workshop in October 2019 in Brunei Darussalam, which will guide implementation of our new work plan 2021-2025, which include gender statistic and sex disaggregated data and women's resilience to emerging threats. Next slide, please. The ACW acknowledges that mainstreaming gender and empowering women and girls is a continuous and collective effort. Engaging different actors and stakeholders at various levels of intervention. As such, the ACW has maintained close collaboration with the ASEAN Plus Three, comprising China, Japan, and Republic of Korea, as well as with the ACWC, or ASEAN Commission on the Promotion and Protection of the Rights of Women and Children, in order to synergize efforts in mainstreaming gender and empowering women and girls. Next slide, please. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, the continued commitment of the ACW to improve the protection and empowerment of women in vulnerable situations, particularly elderly women, is translated through the conduct of the Regional Forum on Strengthening Social Protection Policy, focused on elderly women and aging, held on 10 October 2019 in Brunei, Jerusalem. The event provides an important platform to change knowledge and experiences in addressing key challenges and issues faced by elderly women and identifying innovative approaches to ensure the well being, livelihood, and welfare of elderly women. The regional forum was attended by representatives of ASEAN bodies responsible for women and social welfare issues, local NGOs experts from relevant regional and international organization. Next slide, please. The regional forum noted the following key takeaways. Exchanging knowledge, experiences, and best practices on aging among IMS, AMS. Recognition of the social and economic rights of the elderly the need to provide quality care and support for the elderly, ensuring income security among elderly, elderly as active agents for change rather than just passive recipients of welfare. To identify priority research areas on all age and aging population in ASEAN. Next slide, please. The forum came up with strategic direction and recommendation as follow. Reinforce data generation, collection, use, and analysis on elderly women. Ensure that elderly women live with dignity, independently, and with respect in old age. Expand the coverage of social protection and social assistance for elderly women. Increase investment on care and support systems. Recognize and value elderly women's wisdom, strength, and experiences. Engage elderly women's group, women's associations in policy and program development. Enhance access to and use of technology by elderly women. Next slide, please. Related to important way forwards, the forum agreed that at the regional level, we should articulate gender perspective in the regional action plan to implement the Kuala Lumpur Declaration on Aging, empowering older persons in ASEAN. Utilize life cycle approach, among others, to surface the issues of elderly women in strategic framework on social welfare and development 2020 2021 and ASEAN Committee on Women 2021 to 2025. Explore areas of synergy with the ASEAN Social Work Consortium 
an ASEAN-wide research network on active aging, on providing care and welfare, and generating data and researches on elderly women, including the study on active aging and poverty eradication. Explore areas of cooperation and partnership with other ASEAN sectors, such as health, disaster risk reduction, labor, financial inclusion, and ASEAN partners such as Japan, Korea, and China. Next slide, please. At the national forum, at the national level, the forum is committed to strengthen disaggregation of data for evidence-based policy and program development to make the various elderly women visible in national statistics. Promote integration and policy and program coordination to recognize the intersectionality of elderly women. Continue to build capacities and capabilities of care providers for long-term care, palliative care, and unapplied care to provide care for elderly women and older elderly women. Strengthen community home-based approaches to the provision of care. Size the opportunities arising from the silver economy. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for that insightful overview of the sort of outcomes of the Regional Protection Policy, uh, Social Protection Policy Forum. Um, as you rightly mentioned, as you very correctly identified, that uh, gender equality is really a continuing and collective effort to, to achieve gender equality. And it really requires action both at the national or ASEAN level, as well at the ASEAN level, at the national level. And it will require a multifaceted approach, as you mentioned in the key recommendations from last year's forum, which would be a multifaceted approach that ranges from data collection to expanding social protection to community-based approaches. So with these aspects in mind, uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Mohamed Nasiri, Regional Director, UN Women Asia Pacific. Mohamed will share with us more about the impact of COVID-19 on women in the ASEAN region, including the specific impacts on older women. Mohamed has extensive experience in the region and in gender and development issues. Before joining as Regional Director of the UN Women in Asia Pacific, he was Regional Director UN Women in the Arab States. And prior to that, Mohammed has also worked in Yemen, Kuwait, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Cambodia. So with so much expertise and experience, Mohammed, welcome to the forum, and may I please request you to start your presentation. Thank you very much, and a very good afternoon, Excellencies, um, partners, and, and friends. Allow me first to start by expressing my gratitude to uh, his Excellency, the Deputy Secretary General, for his continued support, his leadership, his energy, his determination to push the agenda forward on every front. Uh, I would also like to uh, say that the excellent presentation of the ASEAN Committee on Women provides a, a natural segue to what we're trying to, to say in the coming few minutes. Um, again, thank you for, for inviting you and women to, to join this very important uh, and timely discussion on, on ASEAN COVID response with particular focus on gender and, and aging. Um, the focus of the presentation will be mainly to address uh, two uh, main uh, questions. The first is, what is the overall impact of, of the COVID-19 pandemic to all women and girls? Um, we will look uh, into some specific impacts on older women, as well as highlight uh, how COVID has impacted on health, economic resilience, violence, and mobility. The second question is how have countries in, in the Asia and the Pacific region responded to COVID in relation to specifically addressing the needs of and the welfare of older women uh, within the first 100 days uh, since the first cases were in, confirmed in Wuhan, UN Women has undertaken an expansive rapid assessment which has allowed us to get the numbers, the data, uh, and the good practices that can inform uh, development, um, uh, the development of recovery plans in, in ASEAN. If we may move to the following slide, um, and um, here we, we do know, and, and uh, everyone around the table today know that women do face greater risks 
of infection uh, because they make up the majority of healthcare workers, um, not only in the region, but globally, uh, from doctors to nurses, midwives, health um, workers, uh, pharmacists, etc., who are on the front lines caring for people who have been infected. Similarly, during disasters such as floods, women also face greater risks and mortality due to pre-existing gender inequalities. Women and girls also face greater risks of violence as, as countries impose at-home at isolation, uh, lockdowns, quarantines, and curfews to try to stem the spread of the virus. The number of calls to domestic violence hotlines in Malaysia, for example, has increased by 57% in the month of March. Um, in Singapore, uh, calls to AWARE Women's Helpline have increased by 33% in February this year in comparison to February of last year. It is also clear that in addition to the violence and in addition to the uh, infection rates, unfortunately, uh, women are bearing the brunt of the pandemic's social and economic impacts. Uh, in ASEAN region, female workers are overrepresented in the hardest hit sectors, manufacturing, textile and garments, hospitality and tourism, care and domestic work. And in the most vulnerable jobs with the least protection, in the informal employment that includes the self-employed domestic workers, daily wage workers, and family members who help the family business. Around the region, it is estimated that hundreds of thousands of female migrant workers, largely employed informally, have been forced to return home where many face stigma and discrimination in addition to the loss of income. Even before COVID, uh, women and girls across ASEAN carried a disproportionate burden of unpaid care and domestic work. For example, in Malaysia, they spent more than three times as much time in this work more than men and boys do. In Cambodia, it goes up to 10 times as much. Uh, with schools now closing uh, across the region, um, the healthcare systems stretched by the pandemic, women are now bearing an even greater responsibility at home, caring for children, ill family members, and the elderly. If we may move to the following slide, uh, and, and this is where I, I can safely that the demographic changes are increasingly shifting the landscape of unpaid care work and domestic work in ASEAN. Um, Demographic changes are increasingly uh, shifting. Most countries in Asia, ASEAN in Asia presently have a relatively young population, uh, yet the majority of the elderly in the world will be living in Asia by 2035. By 2050, over 30% of the population in the People's Republic of China, in Japan, in Singapore, in Thailand, and Vietnam will be aged 60 and over. Uh, women's disadvantage in older age is mainly a result of discrimination throughout the life cycle. Unpaid care work is the main barrier preventing women from getting into and remaining and progressing in the labor force. Access to social security in old age is closely associated with existing gender inequality. While this may partially be due to gender biased design of pension schemes, it is more significantly a result of women's lower labor force participation due to care work. The large number of women who are self-employed and the fact that women often have shorter and interrupted careers. This is evident uh, where pension systems in many countries fail to meet the needs of men and women equitably. This makes older women even more vulnerable without adequate social protection and pension in time of crisis. The system of care for elderly in ASEAN relies on women's unpaid work and informally employed domestic workers or caregivers. A major challenge for the elder care sector is to improve the working conditions of caregivers and increase the share of formal employment in the sector. In addition, the system is less responsive to the care needs of older women, particularly as they tend to live longer than men. 
adequate, gender responsive and dignified care provision for older persons is therefore an urgent policy issue for the region. If we move to the fifth slide, um, and this is where I would like now to uh, turn to some solutions and, and impact that our work contributes to integrate gender considerations in COVID response. It includes learning from emerging good practices uh, around the region. Um, on gender and data um, and, and socioeconomic assessments, since late March, we have rolled out rapid impact assessment surveys uh, through mobile phones in 10 countries, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Maldives, Nepal, Indonesia, Pakistan, Philippines, Samoa, and Thailand. We have been able to gain insights into the impact of COVID on women's employment, access to resources, including wages, remittances, government relief support. We have seen society and families across the region rely on women and girls, particularly to provide unpaid domestic and care work. We are also innovating. For instance, in the case of Indonesia, there is a plan to partner with a tech company to combine big data analytics, innovative methodologies and cost-effective technology for data collection and analysis to measure the impact of COVID on specific vulnerable groups particularly women in informal work and daily wage workers. We are feeding the findings into various government and new end planning processes, such as for the socioeconomic response plans that are being finalized in many countries. UN Women is also active with our advocacy to place women at the center of COVID response in all of the coordination platforms that we are engaged in. And if we move to uh, the following slide, uh, we're going to be talking about also good practices, but in the field of gender-based violence. Um, in support to addressing the, the GBV, uh, we focus on uh, coordination, uh, policy and tools development, um, service delivery, and thirdly, prevention. In, in coordination uh, across the Asia Pacific region, we've been providing coordination and technical assistance to women's machineries and relevant government departments in their development of the national uh, GBV preparedness and response plans. On the policy and guidelines fronts, we've supported the governments and civil society in the rapid adap adaptation and adaption policies and programs related to GBV. Uh, we have worked with partners, in, including GBV, uh, helpline workers and community workers. A strength of our gender-based violence programming in the region is that we already straddle both the humanitarian response and the development nexus. Um, we're used to work in, uh, working in cycles of disasters, as we all know, in this region, and our GBV work is able to adapt and respond to crisis. Um, the lasting benefits of the COVID response will include having structures in place for remote service provision that will enable us to reach out and support women in remote areas using online technology and remote services. If we may move to the following uh, slide. Um, on the economic resilience, um, firstly, we've been advocating for gender responsive social protection and stimulus measures. Uh, our current efforts uh, include aligning with the government COVID response plans and the UN COVID multi-sectoral response, technical support to the government to engage women ministries in strengthening essential services for women and children. Uh, secondly, we have focused on immediate cash transfers, in-kind support as part of a comprehensive strategy. Um, we continue to provide immediate relief um, that is either ongoing or planned, including through cash and cash for work, including protection equipment in Bangladesh, Indonesia, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Uh, thirdly, we do emphasize our support to promote women's economic empowerment as part of the COVID response and recovery by linking private sector companies. Uh, if we move to the slide before last, um, 
ASEAN Vision 2025 and Agenda 2030 call for people-centered approach and leaving no one behind. UN Women stands ready to support ASEAN in achieving the commitment made in various regional frameworks to ensure gender equality and empowerment of women at the center of disaster and humanitarian action, particularly COVID response and recovery, in so that women can act as agents of their own response to ensure inclusive participation and representation in decision making, as well as to strengthen social protection for women, children, youth, and older persons in ASEAN. Finally, um, as, as you know, um, cross-border issues require strong collaboration among ASEAN member states for effective and inclusive COVID response and recovery. ASEAN Regional Cooperation for COVID Response and Recovery is critical. And I would like to end with a few key considerations with a call to action based on the ASEAN priorities. ASEAN Vision 2025 and Agenda 2030 calling for people-centered approach and leaving no one behind. Strong gender data and evidence is critical to inform policy decision-making and ensure that our response is effective and inclusive with specific target to women and girls of most vulnerable and marginalized groups in the region. Socioeconomic recovery requires a gender and human rights lens. Making economic stimulus packages and social policies work for women is key. The starting point is women's economic empowerment with particular attention to increasing access to decent work, eliminating barrier to labor force participation and addressing rising care. Ensuring that stimulus packages target women and focus on jobs and social investments will be critical for strong recovery. Gender responsive social protection is a foundation for inclusive growth and sustainable development. Resilience in time of crisis is the case in point. COVID pandemic calls for stronger investment in affordable and accessible care services for children and elderly, including social services and infrastructure and professionalization of care work. Design of gender sensitive pension systems is essential. This is relevant for both social insurance and social assistance. Social pensions are key to reduce poverty for older women. Non-contributory social pensions are becoming an increasingly important element of public pension policy, particularly in the attempts of lower and middle income countries to achieve universal coverage through a mix of social insurance financed by contributions and social assistance financed from the general budget. Last but not least, linking with the new ASEAN Agreement on Disaster and Emergency Response provides a unique opportunity. ASEAN can strengthen disaster response and recovery by empowering women to join in and lead emergency efforts and using gender data to highlight women's particular vulnerabilities and needs during disasters such as the coronavirus pandemic. Placing women and girls at the heart of response and recovery can turn the current crisis into an opportunity to create a more resilient ASEAN community that leaves no one behind. Thank you very much for your attention. I apologize for being long. And again, thank you for being part of this important dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed, for such an excellent overview of the impact of COVID-19 on women. And um, thank you also for some key takeaways where you've actually shared the emerging good practices from your presentation. Certain things stand out in my mind, for instance. First, of course, is the urgent need to look into the pension systems and to ensure that they become more gender sensitive and actually that they're broadened. The importance of um, investing in the care system, technology, and resource mobilization, as you mentioned, to address GVV. And it is hard for me to learn from you that actually there are so many complementarities between the work of the ASEAN and the UN system. So whether it is Vision 2025 or Agenda 2030, we really are all working towards the same goal. So thank you very much, Mohammed. So we now have time. We have one question here. 
which uh, is coming from Dr. June Go from ACWO. And she's actually addressed this to both the participants. In this unusual time of COVID and social distancing, how can we prevent the isolation of elderly women, but yet ensure the health protection of this very vulnerable group? Ma'am, perhaps you ask Her Excellency to first provide an overview for the response from the ASEAN side, and then Mohammed from the perspective of the UN. Thank you. Hello, Your Excellency, would you like to answer that question? I think in, in general, in, in ASEAN and also in Cambodia, elderly women live in a joint family. So this is one thing that we can prevent isolation of elderly people. And also in, in the communities, people are living together. So uh, the elderly people in Cambodia and in many countries in ASEAN, so they take care of the small children, they take care of the families and also the families take care of them. So uh, this is one thing that we can prevent, prevent isolation of uh, elderly people. But uh, in urban areas, uh, there's something a little bit different because all the children go outside, go to work. Elderly people stay at home. However, for the moment, because of the COVID, so we have children staying at home. So most of the time we see that their children living, staying with the elderly people. So this is what I noticed in our country and in some, uh, in some ASEAN countries. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the question. It's, it's, uh, it's speaking to, to what's happening on the ground. And uh, isolation, in many cases, we need to realize that it is a luxury. Uh, we, we cannot, in many households, uh, afford isolating uh, the elderly from, from the rest of, um, of the uh, uh, family unit. Um, for the immediate response of COVID, we, we need to take the practical measures. We need to make sure that we do have the personal protection equipment that we uh, use and we wear uh, when we come uh, close to those who are infected. We need to make sure that we are disinfecting the surfaces and the, the in environments around us on, on regular basis. Uh, we need to ensure uh, that hygiene, to the extent possible, is being attended to, including uh, simple actions like washing hands regularly, uh, etc. But this is on the immediate term. On the medium and the longer term, I, I, I think I do continue to advocate for having a financial value being paid to the, the care work that is being attended to the elderly. If we manage to have facilities on the medium and longer term that provide uh, professional care, the professionalization of uh, care work, especially for those elderly, is important to make sure that they get the professional uh, attention needed, uh, but also to, in times of, of uh, pandemic and crisis, they are shielded from um, the, the, the larger and the wider community that can be uh, infected, but not necessarily um, uh, are uh, groups uh, that are at high risk like the elder. Back to you. Thank you very much, Mohammed. We do have one more question, but unfortunately, we've just run out of time for this session. So perhaps uh, the, we can come back to that um, uh, question later at the end of the next session if we have time. So thank you to both Your Excellency and Mohammed for a very engaging first session. In the first session, it gave us a very wonderful sort of picture of the current status uh, of uh, the impact of COVID on older women and what's the position so far. Now we're going to move on to the second session where we will more, learn more about the organizational responses to COVID-19 through a gender and age sensitive lens. 
To open the second session, we have with us Dr. Srinivas Tata, Director of the Social Development Division, UNSCAP. Dr. Tata has 15 years of experience of working with the United Nations. He's a physician by qualification with experience in finance, social policy, public health, and program management. Dr. Tata will share more about how countries in the Asia and Pacific have responded to the pandemic in terms of expanding and adopting social protection measures. So thank you, Dr. Tata. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Please could I request you to start your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh... So Preeti, I think, I hope I'm uh, audible. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Following after such distinguished presenters who are so comprehensive in their approach, uh, I hope uh, that is often they speak so well and they've covered the ground so well, especially my, uh, the distinguished excellency from Cambodia and my friend Mohammed, that what comes later, I hope uh, uh, will be up to the mark, but I'll try my best to address the specific issues that have been asked to be addressed by me. Now, as you know, uh, uh, my presentation will address how social protection has been addressed in the, of, uh, in the scope of COVID-19 responses. And also uh, my presentation was asked uh, to focus a little bit on uh, other vulnerable groups and how their needs are being met. And before I move there, maybe some of what I'm going to present has been covered in some way, but it's, uh, uh, it's necessary in order to build the case for social protection. So just going on to my first slide, we all know that COVID-19 affects some population groups more than others. Vulnerable groups uh, most often live on the margins of societies. They often are in insecure informal employment or depend on what is often inadequate social protection systems. And I'm going to look at four groups today. Women, older persons, persons with disabilities and migrants. Now, as we know, women are at increased risk of exposure. The common belief around is, oh, the more men getting more sick and men dying more, so perhaps men are the vulnerable group. But as Muhammad explained, that the fact is women are disproportionately highly represented in the social and health sectors and they're at a higher risk of exposure. Secondly, the pandemic also exacerbates the already disproportionate burden of unfair care work that is borne by women. The economic vulnerability of women is heightened with the risk of many women falling back into poverty. And I, like Mohammed elaborated, and I'm just going to touch upon is the fact that in lockdown conditions, evidence shows that gender-based violence has grown and there's more scope for gender-based violence going up even further. As far as older persons are concerned, we know there's higher morbidity rates due to under, and also uh, due to underlying NCDs and general lower immunities more risk of isolation and abuse, and their immediate economic impact is a lot of them, the survival is dependent on savings and on handouts. And there is also a lack of access. Treatment for NCDs and other health services is affected during uh, the COVID pandemic. And similarly for women, the access to sexual and reproductive health services remains a crisis. Now, persons with disabilities also cover a very large proportion. Uh, we have um, almost 15% of the region's population have some form of disability. They are often poorer than the general population. They are often in vulnerable employment and social distancing is difficult because most of them require personal assistance of people to really help them. Lockdown often has been uh, cutting their access to essential items and support services. They often do not get public information in accessible formats. And those in facilities are in risk of cross-infection and abuse. And last but not least, a group of migrants, which are, we all know, the loss of jobs and trapped in countries with no option of re re coming home. They are at risk of uh, uh, infection due to risky occupations, in particular women migrant workers. And we all know the xenophobia, abuse, and discrimination that uh, migrants have been facing due during this time of COVID. And then I would like to bring up intersectionality. These vulnerabilities often intersect. Just one example. Women and girls with disabilities face greater challenge, both from being a woman and disabled, chronic poverty, social isolation, heightened risk of being victims of violence, denial of sexual and reproductive rights, denial of legal capacities. All these are multiplying or kind of exponentially increasing the risks. As, for example, women with disabilities, as compared to men with disabilities, are three times more likely to have unmet health care needs three times more likely to be illiterate, two times less likely to be employed, 
and two times less likely to use the internet. So when you have intersectionality of all these vulnerabilities, it makes the risk even higher and makes the impact on them even deeper. Going into what is the situation for social protection? We all know that social protection in our region, social protection expenditures remain quite low. If you look at it, the global average is about 11% of GDP, but the Asia Pacific average is less than 4% of the GDP. And in the Southeast Asia region, a number of countries actually are spending slightly less than even the Asia Pacific average. Now this uh, comes with the issue that, uh, the fact that in the long term, if you're going to move towards the social protection floor, the very minimum is to move towards the universal healthcare system of the kind that Thailand has built over the last 20 years and to broaden social protection power to cover all uh, people across the life cycle. About 70% of the region's workers are in the uh, informal sector, which makes it very difficult to extend social protection. A solid social protection floor should include incentives and options for these workers that are already covered in times of need. An innovation has been made in response to COVID-19, where programs have been created targeting informal workers, and a lot of them are from the ASEAN region, including Malaysia and the Philippines. And from uh, outside the subregion, even in Pakistan, there are some good examples. Expenditure on social protection, first and foremost, should not be seen as a cost, but rather as, uh, as an investment. Well, one thing that COVID-19 has actually it's placed social protection up on the agenda of, uh, of, of the policymakers. It's, no, it's clear that countries which have a strong universal healthcare system and a social protection system are doing much better in dealing with COVID than countries which do not. Now, we, have a, we did a review that over, we know that over two thirds, about 36% of the population of Asia Pacific has uh, kind of access to any one social protection measure. So have lack access to any one social protection measure. Some social protection measures are better. For example, a larger proportion of the population may have access to healthcare. Maybe about 64% have access to old age protection, but this remember includes so social pension. Now, which is not as high as, uh, as a contributory scheme, but at least some, they, they contribute in some measure to alleviating poverty. Uh, severely disabled, about 40% coverage. Employment injuries, only 40% coverage. Unemployment benefits are very low. They're only 28%. So on an aggregate, only 36, I mean, percent of the population are covered adequately by social protection in the region. Now, in terms of pension coverage, the coverage of pension remains quite low. It's higher in some of the developed countries, but it's lower for some of the developing countries, including many of the ASEAN countries. Now, within that, remember men have the higher coverage as opposed to women. And this we see, uh, it's a phenomenon throughout developed as well as developing countries. And our surveys have shown that pensions are really not the main source of income for, uh, for older persons, as my next slide will show. Older persons receive uh, income from a variety of sources, and they may be work. Uh, remember, a very significant proportion of older persons actually work, and that, can, that maybe has been uh, impacted even during the COVID. Only about a, a small proportion in many countries receive their uh, main source, uh, see, pensions are the main source of income. Some of them uh, get old age allowance, some of them have in income from savings, a very large proportion get intergeneration transfers from their children and other relatives. So as you can see, that during COVID-19 crisis, what has been a, a very important source has been this old age allowance or the, or the so-called social pension scheme. This has been seen, uh, many countries have increased contributions to this route, and this has really helped many countries in alleviating the situation of older persons. Another thing that's very commonly known, but it's significant that most of the older persons in Asia, older persons, the significant, the proportion of older women is larger than that of older men. That is when biologically women also outlive men. But the fact is, uh, a number of older women, uh, I mean, at the singulate age of marriage, the woman, the spouse actually is on an average less than about five years younger 
than the male spouse. So the years of uh, that a male, woman spouse lives alone after the death of the male spouse is quite significant. If you take into account the, the life expectancy as well as the difference of the age of marriage, throughout the time that an older, older man re wants to be taken care of, the woman is there to take care of him. But the moment the woman is alone, there is often no one to take care of the older woman. So that is a very significant uh, need that, that makes an older woman far more vulnerable in the context of, uh, of both in terms of care and during her last years of life. Another very, one very key importance of how to improve, therefore, the, how to reduce the vulnerability of women. One of the key reasons why women are vulnerable is because they are not uh, economically, uh, economically independent, they're not empowered. Well, if you really want them to be empowered and if you want them to be covered by social protection, then the fact is you have to bring them into the labor force. Now, access to social protection is very key. And in the last ministerial conference on Beijing Plus 25, uh, advancing women's economic empowerment and getting them within the labor force and increasing the social protection coverage was identified as one of the key areas of focus. Now, this economic downturn that we are facing is going to be uh, going to have a disproportionately heavier impact on older women, giving the limited access to income, whether through employment or through assets through land or property, and also because they have much lower access to access to pension. So women, though they uh, represent 65% of people above retirement age, a very small proportion of them actually have pension. So more than older men, it is the older women that are going to face the, the impact of the uh, economic downturn. In terms of SCAP, what, what are we doing in, in terms of promoting women's economic empowerment? Employment is one of, we believe is one of the most important keys for access to social protection uh, through maternity leave benefits, unemployment benefits. Women's labor force participation has, dec uh, has declined by five percentage points, especially in certain regions such as South Asia. We are regressing in certain sub-regions. And so it is very important that we economically empower women in order to re reverse this trend. The difference in labor force participation between men and women stands at 34 percentage points. And this, uh, as you can see, this would further demand, determine the fact that obviously a very larger proportion of men then have contributory pensions as opposed to women who have very little pension or life savings uh, when they go into old age. So therefore, I think uh, the economic empowerment of women in the long term is the only way you're going to address the vulnerability of older women in the future. In terms of informal work, we all know that whereas social protection uh, measures may be woefully inadequate for men and women employed in the formal economy, it is non-existent in the informal economy. Women in the informal are disproportionately represented in the informal economy and are at a high risk of falling into poverty at old age. At, in 2020, the ASEAN labor force participation was 68% consolidated. The male labor force participation is 79.5%, but the female labor force participation is a 57.5%, which is 22% less than, so the gender gap is 22% in terms of uh, uh, labor force participation. We have to get more women into work and that too into paying secure work and not into vulnerable employment. Now, in terms of unpaid care work, something that's been really elaborately explained by Mohammed, so I will really go quickly over this. The fact that while women and men work in the informal economy, access some form of social protection, the majority of women work the longest hours and four times more as much in unpaid care work as compared to men. So the women who are putting in uh, with the number of older persons in Asia Pacific expected to double from 13.6% in 2020 to almost 25% in 2050, we are going to see a considerable increase of burden of care work. And this should not be at the expense of ex unpaid care work of women. Women compare. Dr. Tata, but may I please give you a gentle yes. reminder about yes. two minutes? Yeah, Thank you. So, as our populations live longer, the demand for care services will increase. We also know that the use of digital service the devices varies by age. You know that access to IT technology, we know that older persons are far less, uh, uh, have uh, far the digital divide between 
the 25 to 74 age group and 74 plus is very high. And within the older persons, men use uh, mobile devices far more than women. So in terms of responses, I have a list of responses here. In terms of social assistance packages, most of the, every country has instituted some form of response. But the key has been in terms of smooth delivery of, uh, of benefits, the process of 19 countries have put in place cash transfers and 19 countries have put in place some kind of in-kind benefits. So in terms of older persons, so the, the main uh, specific policy responses that have targeted older women, to tell you the truth, there are very few new large scale social protection initiatives that target older women. The three main types of initiatives, the new emergency packages that you have seen in Malaysia, Myanmar, and Pakistan. Pak, uh, in Myanmar, it will use part of his US dollar nine million package towards the social pension scheme. And similarly, Malaysia will use a part of its $6 million package to reach vulnerable older persons. In China, a one-off payment is being made on the current welfare payment for older persons. Then uh, there is also boosting of existing schemes that is take, taking place in Hong Kong, China, and India. So what are the key learnings? The key learnings, this is my last slide, Madam Moderator, are to institute targeted programs to meet immediate need of older women, we need to adjust to a society for all ages, and we need to, uh, uh, to really ensure that older persons are fully integrated within society. We need to offer schemes to, for continued in, uh, income security, and we need to ensure, like my friend Mohammed says, the mainstreaming of women's concerns into our pension schemes. And last but not least, with the demand for long-term care increasing, it cannot be at the expense of women's unpaid work. We must have states taking responsibility and ensure that the burden for unpaid work is shared equally between men and women. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Tata, for that very engaging presentation. Um, your presentation also reinforces some of the points that have emerged from the earlier presentations, as you just mentioned, the importance of social protection. And I particularly like what you said, and I hope that governments in the take that into heed, that spending on social protection is not actually a cost, but an investment. And also with social protection at the same time, you very rightly highlighted the importance of the economic empowerment of women. And thank you for sharing some of the key learnings that you have come from in your NESCAP. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to now introduce the next speaker, Ms. Susanna Concorda Harding, Senior Director, International Longevity Center, South Foundation. Susanna has been working with the South Foundation for over 18 years, and she uh, uh, has extensive experience in community development, policy advocacy, and in the nonprofit sector. Susanna will talk today about civil society responses to addressing the gender impact of the pandemic on older persons. Susanna, thank you for joining us today. May I please request you to start your presentation? Susanna, could you please start your presentation? Sorry. Yes, thank you very much, Supriti, for, for the very kind introduction. I'm here today to share about the civil society responses in addressing gendered impact of COVID-19 on older persons. I come from South Foundation, which is a Singapore-based but regionally oriented foundation that advances a positive transformation of the aging experience. We seek mindset and systemic change by implementing innovation in community-based elder care, training and education, policy-relevant research, collaboration, and advocacy. We work with and support older persons' ability to maximize the opportunities in longevity and strengthens intergenerational solidarity. ILC Singapore, one of the four initiatives of the foundation, is also a member of the ILC Global Alliance that aims to help societies to address longevity and population aging in positive and productive ways using a life course approach. 
and there are 16 ILC centers across the globe. In May 2020, the ILC Global Alliance actually came out uh, with a statement on the impact of COVID-19 based on the experiences from the 16 member countries. And I just wanted to highlight a few of the main statements uh, coming from the Global Alliance. As a global alliance, we denounce ageism, age discrimination, xenophobia, and other human rights violations in the management of the pandemic, the treatment of affect, infected and affected persons. We also urge that older persons' perspectives should be taken into account in the design and implementation of COVID-19 related measures to ensure that they are relevant to and respectful of their lived experiences. We also call for effective oversight and time limitation on any suspension of civil liberties. We support basic and applied sciences leading to optimal testing, treatment, and immunization programs, as well as enhance public health literacy. We acknowledge the fault lines of social inequalities brought to the fore by the pandemic, and we champion their urgent amelioration through both short-term and long-term strategies. We acknowledge the continuing contribution of older persons to family and the community, and we extend gratitude to frontline workers for their selfless commitment in addressing the health, social, and economic impact of the pandemic. In February 2020 this year, we actually started, uh, the foundation has started through its International Longevity Center Singapore, a regional project that wants to pilot test in two countries how we can really promote financial security of older women in the region. This project is called Pro Older Women, and this is a project we are been implementing in partnership with Health Age International and with our country partners, the Coalition of Services for the Elderly or COSE in the Philippines and the Foundation for the Older Persons Development or FAPDEV in Thailand. The project aims to enhance the older women's well-being through improved financial security in Southeast Asia. Specifically, we want to build a stronger network of aging and women organizations in the Philippines and Thailand which is capable of mainstreaming and aging and gender in all the policies and programs, able to mobilize support for older women, and also can act as a strategic partner of ASEAN, especially governments within Philippines and, and uh, Thailand. Then COVID came. So by March, we realized that as, as, a, as a project, we needed to be able to quickly um, utilize the different strategies that we have identified to be able to respond and make it really responsive to the needs of, of both older women as, as women and also of them being uh, an aging population and a more vulnerable uh, uh, population uh, uh, segment of the population. So in terms of the capacity building, we have conducted the baseline assessment on the programs, policies, and genders capacity of our partner organization. And we realized that there really is a need, even at the civil society level, the need to find out, the need to be able to, uh, to up from a gender neutral to, from, uh, or gender blind to a more gender responsive uh, uh, vision, policies, and programs of the, of the partners. We also realized that staff needs to up their training and capacity, and therefore we are actually planning to roll out a nine-week uh, online training program on gender equality using the Help Age training modules on partnership with women organizations. Uh, as a result of the COVID, what we have done, our partners in the Philippines and Thailand have met with women organizations mm -hmm. in both countries and identified common issues women across all ages faces during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. We have learned from them how Susanna, I'm sorry, I think you got cut off there. We'll need to bring you back in. Oops. Sorry? You just got cut off. Could you just repeat the last slide? Oh, okay. I don't know why. Uh oh, this one? Hello, can you see me? I can see you. If you could just repeat the slide that you just mentioned about the, uh, you were just talking the last one minute, basically. This one? Yeah. The th okay. Thailand. No, the one after that. 
Okay, sorry. So when, when COVID-19 happened, as I've said, uh, all the four strategies that we wanted to pursue to be able to uh, realize the uh, financial security for older women, we had to make sure that it's also very much responsive to the needs of the, uh, the pandemic, uh, especially of older women, and because of their vulnerability, both because of age as well as gender. And, and all the explanations by both uh, Muhammad and Dr. Tata has already mm -hmm. explained that, but to us, it's, it was a very real and specific experience. Mm -hmm. And I'll be sharing about how it has happened and what we have done both in Thailand and Philippines. Okay, so for our partners in, in the Philippines and Thailand, uh, they met with women organizations and identified common issues women across all fa ages face during the COVID-19 pandemic. We've learned that how the younger women are affected and how this can exacerbate in an in older age if left unattended. Through working with them, we also learned that the issues older women face were because of the accumulated disadvantages they have experienced throughout their life course. On research and communications, uh, ILC Singapore recently concluded and presented two studies related to COVID-19. The first one is a study uh, on the impact of COVID-19 on generally healthy community dwelling older persons in Wampo, which is one of our uh, sites in Singapore. And, uh, and also the other one, it was a study that we have done as part of the Singapore Alliance for Women and Aging, or SAWI, which is the national level alliance uh, working and advocating on the issue of older women in Singapore on the impact of COVID-19 on female family caregivers of older persons. Both studies are actually available, uh, the, the slides, if, you, if you're interested on, on the South Foundation website. Or if you, if you cannot access it, uh, you can drop me an email later. We're also trying to work uh, with our partners in Thailand and Philippines on how we can replicate some of these studies that we have done in Singapore to, to the two countries. Furthermore, under Pro Older Women Project, both partners are producing communication materials specific on the gendered impacts of COVID-19 to older persons and how this can be addressed. On advocacy and policy making, our partners are have been working in advocating with the uh, have been working with the government advocating for gender responsive and age sensitive policy rep responses like the inclusion of older women and men in the emergency cash aid of the government in the short term and filling up the policy gaps in income security of older women such as the need to expand the social pro pension program in Philippines and Thailand. In Thailand case, after series of meetings and online seminar, our partner FAPDEP is now working with the Women Network for Progress and Peace or WNPP and is now exploring a joint study on the impact of COVID-19 to women. Through the partnership with you and Women Philippines, we were able to explore not only the vulnerabilities and insecurities of older women, but also what they can contribute in responding to the pandemic. Older women issues were also included in the policy brief of you and Women Philippines. As the pandemic also highlighted the shortcomings of the current targeted social protection system for older persons, particularly older women, our partner in the Philippines Kose used this opportunity to campaign for two important issues on financial security. One campaign was to make sure that all older women and men are included in the government social amelioration program. Second, they went, uh, they had a campaign to pressure for the passage of the universal social pension bill. As a result of these two campaigns, older persons with low pensions, mostly older women, are now included in the second tranche of the social amelioration program. Two days ago in Philippines Congress, the committee has approved substitute bill on the 1,000 peso social pension. Back to Singapore, of course, we have been working as a foundation, we have been working with the, in, since 2016 uh, with the Asian Development Bank as its center of excellence and knowledge partner in building the capacity and capability of six middle income countries in the Asia Pacific, including three ASEAN countries, Indonesia, Philippines, and Thailand to set up long-term care system. And I think the, the pandemic has also given us uh, an opportunity to learn how we can incorporate some of the best practices or emerging learning good practices to be able to make sure that this long-term care system would actually be really be, be both gender and aging responsive as well as take into account the 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 differential impact of uh, of a pandemic or this kind of situation the challenges is still there 
uh, it is crucial to monitor how restrictions are implemented to prevent governments from using the current crisis to justify new constraints on civic spaces, which have already been shrinking in many places during the last 15 years. There is difficulty to reach the vulnerable older persons in isolated areas because the limited access to technology, as has already been mentioned, which worsens the digital divide. Many policies single out older persons and some policies are considered to be ageist. For example, 24-hour care for you to all 60 years old and above. Moving forward, uh, we see the need to work together, to work together with uh, multilateral organizations, with government and other civil society, both those who work with older people as well as those who work uh, with women as well as the younger, uh, the next generation, to enhance genuine digital civil society engagement in COVID-19 era. We hope that there's more effective recognition of the contribution of older women and men as a resource and not just as a beneficiary in developing COVID-19 response and recovery plans. And therefore, we hope that there is more representation from women and older persons organizations as part of the national technical working groups to be able to identify moving forward, where are we going as, as a society and as a community. And of course, uh, as, as uh, our experience in the Pro Older Women Project, the team and the partners are very much uh, committed to working with ASEAN Secretariat and the different uh, multilateral agencies and governments to be able to hopefully uh, and, uh, bring this kind of experience also to other ASEAN countries and not just to uh, Singapore, uh, Philippines, and Thailand. With that, I thank you very much. Thank you, Susanna, for that snapshot of civil society responses. And you have very correctly reminded us of two important factors that we need to always include all the person's perspectives in any of our responses going forward. And also, again, a theme that has come up in previous presentations, but is also reiterated in yours, about the importance of leveraging digital technology. And the success of the Philippines case of the Pro Older Women Project is useful because I hope it'll give other civil society organizations a useful learning experience that perhaps they could learn and replicate elsewhere. Thank you very much. Uh, with the previous two presentations now providing an overview of civil society and country responses, we are now delighted to introduce our final speaker for this session, Mr. Sisavat Kompong, on behalf of the Chair of the Senior Officials Meeting on Social Welfare and Development, or SOMSWAT. Mr. Kompong is currently serving as Deputy Director General for Devotees, Persons with Disability and Older Persons, and Deputy Director General to National Coordinating Office for PWD and Elder Persons, Government of Laos, PDR. He will speak today about the joint statement of the ASEAN Ministerial Meeting on Social Welfare and Development on mitigating impacts of COVID-19 on vulnerable groups in ASEAN. Mr. Sisavat, we are privileged to have you to join us today. May I please ask you to start your presentation? Thank you. Mr. Sisavat? I think we're having some technical issues in connecting to Mr. Sisavat. If you could just bear with us for a moment. I suppose this is the thing that we're talking about digital technologies and some of the challenges. And I see this is, uh, we're also facing it like this at the moment ourselves about the challenge. Yes, yes. Um, Thank you, Mr. Sisavat. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Can? Yes, please, we can request you to start your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, first of all, I would like to Excellency Ben uh, Fok, Deputy Secretary General of ASEAN for Social Cultural Committee. Dear Excellency, Mr. Madam, and colleagues from international organization. On behalf of SOMSWAT La PDR, as a chair of ASEAN SOMSWAT, I would like to express my deep thanks to ASEAN Secretary and international organization that held this forum today in order to share the experience and knowledge and the best practice on the COVID-19 Let's focus on gender and aging. First, I would like to uh, present you about the ASEAN statistics on the 
on the population. The next slide, please. Okay, as you may see on the screen, in the next 10 years, the ASEAN will become the 18th region. On ASEAN country, will become 18th uh, society uh, that you see the Thailand and Singapore will be become the super eight in the in the next future. And the number of older person in ASEAN is increasing uh, faster than developed country in Europe and USA. And you will see the more women living longer than men. This then require a gender response, responsive approach in policy making. This is the statistic that you see uh, that will be increased in the future. So next slide, I will talk about the uh, key regional instrument that you see there are five instruments in our ASEAN that are leader, uh, tied to issue. One is the Brunei Darussalam Declaration on Strengthening Family Institution Carry for the Elderly in 2010. Next, the ASEAN Declaration on Strengthening Social Protection. And third, the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration. Fourth, the regional framework and action plan to implement the ASEAN Declaration on Strengthening Social Protection. The last, the Kuala Lumpur Declaration on Aging, Empowering the Older Person in ASEAN. This is the document that the, our leader agree and adopt in order to be the uh, guidance for our member state to extend this document to implement in the nation. <coughs> so next I uh, will focus on uh, Kuala Lumpur Declaration on Aging and Powering on the Person in ASEAN. As you see, there are three components that our leader uh, have the commitment and have a recognition and also the promotion. Uh, the commitment is to reaffirm the commitment to build the ASEAN community that uh, engage and benefit the people and it's inclusive, sustainable, reliable, and dynamics. The recognition that and increase in the proportion of all the population will require adaptation of healthcare and social support system to meet this emerging challenge. The last proportion, promotion, the promotion of the healthy, active productivity, productive aging in the enabling and supportive environment is the key to well-being of older person as vulnerable member of the family, community, and with loans and less responsibility towards the self and other nation. Next slide. Um, I will deeply uh, to, to present you about the commitment under KL declaration. There are 10 commitments that the ASEAN uh, leader uh, has consensus to promote. Uh, one is to promote share responsibility in supporting care caregiver. Next, uh, promote integrational solidarity. Third, promote right-based, need-based, and right approach, the right cycle approach, and eliminate on on form of man treatment based on own aid. Four, mainstream etching into public policy and national development plan program. Five, promote the development of the human cap capital. Six, develop 
of reliable evidence based gender dis discrete data on aging. Seven, strengthen capacity of all stakeholders, improve delivery service at all levels, encourage development of all the people association or other form of networking. Nine, promote a friendly community and city. Ten, build and strengthen network and partnership uh, within the among AMS and with other partners. So this is the commitment. There are 10 commitments that the ASEAN member uh, agreed to implement. Um, next slide, I would like to um, talk about the uh, action plan. That the, the last I talked about the KL commitment. Uh, so to implement the commitment, the ASEAN summit has adopted the uh, plan of action to implement Kuala Lumpur uh, declaration on empowering on the person. So uh, I will talk about a key point that <coughs> is quite really another uh, partnership development. So one is about uh, fusionary policy that they protect and promote, promote the right of older person and to sustain support across pillar and sector. Two, develop effective prevention supported by national legal framework and institutional mechanism. The last, the draft action, as I mentioned earlier, as you uh, have heard. So, in order to empower men of older person, aligned with the Mantris International Plan of Action on 18 2002, the next slide uh, I will show you about the mechanism that the ASEAN. Uh, has assigned the arms work with the support of some work to coordinate and collaborate with the relevant sector for intersectoral cooperation on the empowerment of older person and to develop regional plan of action on aging to implement the declaration. So this is the mechanism that uh, we, uh, we use in ASEAN. Next, um, the last I would like to talk about the, the statement of the arms work uh, mitigating impacts of COVID-19 on vulnerable group. Um, in, this, in this slide, I would like to highlight some uh, recognize that the ASEAN one is the uh, ASEAN legal night, the different, uh, different tail and disproportionate impacts of, of spare of the violence on poor children, older person, women and girl, person with disability and other vulnerable group. The second ASEAN also recognize the determinative effects of the pandemic on the person, namely high um, fatality rate, accelerate uh, poverty, intersection thing, discrimination, particularly on the women, neck brace, abuse in institution and care facility, a limited pension coverage. The first ASEAN earn on stakeholder to integrate the focus on on the person COVID-19 less one, not only the recipient of care and support, but also recognize them as provider of care and community services. As such, they shall be treated with respect and provided 
with essential services and protected from maintenance provided by Etrin. This is the uh, principle that I would like to highlight three points. Next, I uh, would like to focus on the uh, measure of the ASEAN arms award that get the consensus. There are seven, there are seven points. One is to facilitate the access to social protection with the appropriate allocation of public fund for social spending. Two, protect the right safety and dignity, promote protection of the right of general public agreement on form of discrimination, violence, necklace, and exploitation, and to be improved in less form to the COVID-19 pandemic. Third, suppress the health and safety of social, net, of social workers at the forefront of the pandemic, less fun at all level, a loss of fiction, public expenditure that would balance the community of social welfare and social safety net and social protection delivery. Next, strengthen interagency cooperation at the national level and intersectoral cooperation at the ASEAN level. Strengthen multi-sectoral cooperation. Five, endeavor to develop comprehensive and integrate post-pandemic recovery program that recognize the specific vulnerability of the poor children, older person, person with disability, and women and girl, migrant worker, as well as other vulnerable. Group. Six, commit to develop continuity plan and measure that are disability inclusive, gender responsive, age sensitive, and promote social sorority, children participation in course consultation with and my uh, meaningful participation. The last style to leverage on technology and recognize the need to address the digital divide across and within ASEAN members. The ASEAN stay unified and work together to identify the regional cooperation at the ASEAN level to support the action at all level that place the poor and the vulnerable group at the center of on COVID-19 response and recovery measure. In particularly, work closely to fully implementation, the regional framework and action plan on implementing the ASEAN declaration on the strengthening social protection. The ASEAN and bring master plan 2025 mainstreaming the right of person with disability and the last the ASEAN regional plan of action on the eliminate elimination of violent against children uh, this is my uh, presentation that the ASEAN the country together work hard in the past time we have uh, so many documents that issue uh, for our guidance to implement. So thank you very much for giving me a floor to present you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sisavat, for that very interesting overview of ASEAN's commitments. And uh, you've really reminded us of how the, the long history of commitment that the ASEAN has had to all the persons, including the Kuala Lumpur Declaration and the COVID-19 responses are really a reflection of that commitment to all the persons. And while your presentation also highlights as a recurring theme that has come through throughout the three, two sessions of the importance of social protection, you have also underlined the need for intersectoral and interagency cooperation 
at the regional and national level, which will be very important as we move forward with COVID-19 responses. So thank you very much again. Um, so I will now like to invite, we have, don't have too much time, so we would like to invite two or three short questions from the floor. Um, we have one, one question that was actually summarized in a way was about, um, that I can perhaps address to Dr. Tata, which is about the resilience and coping mechanisms for older persons going forward. How would, uh, how would you see it in terms of job discrimination and loss? How could we move forward and build upon the coping and resilience of older persons? So perhaps I could address that to Dr. Tata. Yes, I, I think, well, we, we, we are very countries and when we prescribe uh, policies, we're so much focused on hardware that perhaps it is the software that we, where, that we lack, uh, um, that we sometimes don't provide enough on. And this is the whole issue of providing emotional support and really supporting them better in dealing with this pandemic. I think one is, of course, ensuring that they're economically, the fact that they're economically secure. That's a very big part of providing a strength to them. But apart from them, if the community responses are a very big part of providing support and building their resilience. And I think uh, uh, Marianne Sao in her last, uh, in, in a previous webinar, and Susanna, I'm sure, will also attest to it, is the role of communities and intergenerational support of the community coming together and supporting uh, the older person. There are definitely a lot in the need of emotional support. A lot of them need support during this time of social isolation to take care of their daily needs. They also need to understand there are people around them who, who are willing to take care of them and to, to look after them. So we need uh, countries which have had these structures, had these kind of mechanisms at decentralized levels, which can, which where, where people in the community actually look up on older persons. Uh, there have been some very good examples, whether from Vietnam or from other countries where, or even in Thailand, where you have perhaps a more community-led approach. And I think that's going to be, so I see it as two parts, addressing the hardware in terms of income support and ensuring access to healthcare, but addressing the software in terms of providing the community level support and also providing them the real mental and emotional support for them to tie through this crisis. So I think we got to have a combination of both. Thank you. We have time just for one more question um, that I can please address to Susanna, which is about ageist treatment, since you mentioned ageism in your presentation. Uh, there seems to be ageist treatment to, during COVID as authorities still have biased attitudes towards aging. How can we make the authorities not be ageist? It's, I think it's, uh, well, advocacy is, uh, is, is one very uh, important strategy. And I think empowerment of uh, citizens, uh, older persons themselves is also one very good strategy. If older persons are fully empowered and able to make their voices heard, and uh, we know that the, the older persons to a certain extent is not a just one group that, that uh, everybody is, 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 is the same profile. It's a diverse group of people and uh, we need to be able to understand who among this uh, uh, older population are the most vulnerable and which are the ones that uh, could potentially be a source for some of those uh, support that uh, Dr. Tatas mentioned uh, about from the community itself. The older persons could actually be part of the solution and part of the co-creation of some of the support to other older persons. So I think it's the difficulty with this pandemic is it caught us everybody by surprise. So to a certain extent, it was a living and evolving uh, uh, situation that um, and, 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 and taking the more institutional uh, situation about the mortality then kind of closes some of the responses, potential responses and contribution of the older persons into this evolving uh, situation and then being labeled together as the moment you are age 60, you are vulnerable is uh, certainly um, based on, uh, on, on, on the data that we are getting from from our, uh, the, the data that we're getting from our community in Singapore certainly may not be true for every older persons. Certainly we, we recognize that they are vulnerable, but 
not everybody is vulnerable. So how to, in evolving, uh, an evolving pandemic like this, how do we make sure that the real-time data is able to inform and able to segmentize uh, who are the most vulnerable and how we can um, mobilize them in the community. I think the other uh, issue around ageism is, uh, of course, those in the long-term care facilities, right? Uh, and and there has been uh, a lot of uh, well, certainly not in this in this region, but uh, we could learn from the experiences of the northern con uh, western countries on this, and to learn how we can better uh, understand how we can support uh, older persons uh, in the long-term care facilities to make sure that they may be vulnerable, but there are other, con there are other um, impact of COVID-19 that's not physical. It's more the social isolation and the mental and well-being as well of older persons. So we, we, we need to have more data and real-time data and, and a lot of uh, discussions real-time that involves the older persons themselves and not just us professional caregivers. Thank you, Dr. Susanna, for that uh, very succinct uh, uh, answer. Um, unfortunately, we do have a few more questions, but unfortunately we have run out of time for today's session. Uh, thank you to all the participants for all the questions. I know some, some of you didn't get all of your questions answered, so we will be trying to explore other ways in which we can answer some of the questions. The questions will be on the Q&A button, and when we do, we will be synthesizing a report of this uh, event later, so perhaps we could incorporate some of the responses to that, your questions in that. We will be exploring other ways, um, but for the moment, I'm sorry, we can't take on any more questions, but thank you very much. Now, in the first part of this forum, we've really got an idea of very good sort of description of the current situation on COVID-19 and the impact on older women, and also heard about responses from different uh, organizations, UN, civil society, and ASEAN on how they're responding to this crisis. So now we really come to next steps. How do we take these emerging lessons that we've got, the current policy responses, and move forward? in the post-COVID response and recovery. So for the second part of the forum, I will now be stepping, over, stepping down and handing over the moderation to Mr. Miguel Muskni, Senior Officer, Poverty Eradication and Gender Division at the ASEAN Secretariat. It has been a pleasure and a privilege to have moderated the first half of the session. Miguel, can I please hand over the moderation to you? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sopiji, for the excellent and superb moderation for the first part of this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, as you've mentioned, we are now approaching the latter part of this uh, forum, which is on <clears throat> policy uh, responses. No? Uh, in preparing the presentation for uh, this part of the uh, webinar, uh, we asked ourselves two basic questions no? uh, as a reflection on what were discussed during the first part or the first two sessions. No? So we're looking at what do we need to respond to and how are we going to respond? Now, uh, to answer the first question, and while my colleague is, um, while my colleague is uh, 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 flashing the uh, slide, uh, there are three things that we want to uh, articulate. First is that the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed pre-existing risks and vulnerabilities. And it's quite apparent from all the presentations during the first and second sessions. But what we need to further recognize is that the demographic shift in the region is disproportionately impacting older women. And we can take a cue from two underlying drivers, which are unpaid care and domestic work, which can be further unpacked by saying that and looking at how this can be addressed without commodifying uh, women, and also looking at the informality or the incidence of informality uh, in the region. And lastly, we and answering the first question of what we need to respond to, no? we need to take a look at public investments, no? public spending on gender responsive social protection, on cross sectoral cooperation, and addressing the seeming lack of targeted programs for older women. Because it has been firmly established that aging in ASEAN wears a woman's face. Now, after looking at what we need to respond to, we also have we also have some ideas already of uh, how are we responding. If we take a look back at the uh, message of uh, DSG Kofo and the sharing from member states from ACW and SOMSWAT, we see that the um, motivation is to make visible older women and to address issues of security, 
issues of dignity and respect. And how is this done? It's clear that ASEAN has already placed a high priority on gender, on promoting gender equality. And we've seen in the presentation of DCW and SOMSWA that there is a programmatic approach being uh, utilized. And also there is a clear recognition of a diversity of women you know, in the region. And this brings us to uh, the, the value of intersectionality you know, as, a frame, as a frame for us to respond. And also, um, lastly, some uh, approaches on meaningfully engaging older persons because we, we, we don't only see them as uh, passive recipients of welfare, but there's also a push to recognize them, to see them as active agents of change, you know? uh, especially in preparing for recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. So these two questions, what we need to respond to and how are we responding, is how we frame these potential policy responses to mitigate the impacts of COVID-19 on gender and aging. So next slide, please. So what we look at now is uh, in the short term, at the regional level, there are some opportunities for integrating gender and aging in COVID-19 response and recovery. Currently, there is a rapid assessment of ASEAN impacts of COVID-19 pandemic on livelihoods and ASEAN populations. This is a, a, an ongoing uh, study, a rapid assessment, which presents the opportunity to integrate and articulate uh, the specific impacts of uh, the uh, pandemic on older women. Uh, also, there is a more comprehensive study on the socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic, which again presents an opportunity to carve that niche of articulating the uh, different impacts of this pandemic on uh, older women. Now, um, also within this year, in the short term, uh, ASEAN in partnership with UN Women is developing the ASEAN Gender Outlook. Now, this report looks at uh, uh, generating data um, at the um, uh, AMA and ASEAN member states level, at the regional level, not just on delivering on SDGs, but looking at the gender aspect of the SDGs. And this report, uh, uh, as was um, consulted before previously, would contain uh, a specific section on the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. So that in itself, again, presents an opportunity uh, to articulate this uh, uh, nexus between gender and aging. Uh, next slide, please. Now, one key uh, development that we are looking at, which again would reaffirm ASEAN's uh, high political commitment on uh, gender and uh, aging no? is the development of the ASEAN Declaration on Promoting Social Work. Uh, this declaration uh, would serve as a common framework to promote and strengthen social work at regional level. Uh, it would set the agreement for a common set of priorities to strengthen social work uh, in the region, build collaboration, and achieve one voice, one commitment, and a common understanding of the role and value of social workers. Uh, we see this as a um, critical element of uh, the delivery and enhancing access to social protection, and at the same time, an enabling factor no, for older women uh, to be engaged and to have access to vital services and support. Uh, next slide, please. So after looking at specific short-term uh, initiatives by way of uh, responding to what we have been discussing, we can also take a look at uh, medium-term responses. So one is um, on the programmatic approach in addressing issues of older persons. Uh, the SOMSWAT chair earlier has already, SOMSWAT chair has already mentioned that SOMSWAT is already developing or in the process of developing their five-year work plan and is currently wrapping up the, the implementation of the current work plan uh, covering the period of 2016 to 2020. And as we can see here, there is a specific focus on vulnerable groups, uh, specific sectors, no? and one of which is uh, older persons. So uh, by engaging this process, there is again an opportunity to articulate uh, the nexus between gender aging and highlight the dimensions of uh, issues related to older persons, uh, uh, older women rather. Uh, next slide, please. Now, apart from uh, some sorts work, five-year work plan, uh, there's also a network that specifically focuses on research and uh, on aging. So <clears throat> currently, 
uh, Malaysia is leading this uh, initiative on the ASEAN-wide research network on aging, which provides a platform for exchange uh, of policy studies, uh, dialogue, best practices, and also it uh, gathers uh, ASEAN experts to <clears throat> develop a research agenda and other uh, research on aging within the region. So again, this is uh, one policy response of addressing this need for data, of making visible older women, and uh, not just uh, broadly on issues of aging, but specifically focusing on impacts of COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Now, jumping from the social welfare sector, we go to the health sector. Uh, in the health sector, they are currently implementing ASEAN Health Corporation's promotion of healthy and active aging. Uh, and the vision is uh, a healthy, caring, sustainable ASEAN community. Now, if we can go to the next slide, we can see here that there is a specific uh, uh, set of measures under cluster one on promoting healthy lifestyle. Uh, the sixth priority is on promotion of healthy and active aging. Uh, we see this as uh, uh, an opportunity for cross-sectoral collaboration between social welfare sector and the health sector to advance in an integrated manner uh, health issues and active aging issues both from the health uh, perspective and the social welfare perspective. Now to complement this, if, uh, next slide please. We take a cue from Thailand's leadership no, on establishing the ASEAN Center for Active Aging and Innovation. Now the ASEAN leaders recognize the need to work together to prepare well for aging societies and the economic and social shifts and also the challenges posed to public health system. Now the center, or it's called ACHAI or ACHAI, is envisaged to be a multi-sectoral platform to facilitate integration of aging and innovation strategies. Now if we move to the next slide, and I think this is the last slide from our side, the purpose of the center is to generate knowledge and innovation uh, which supports active aging policies and their implementation, strengthen capacities, etc. So uh, I think the the caveat we have to make here is that this is not an exhaustive list of potential opportunities for policy responses, but these are the policy responses that we are looking at in the short term and in the medium term, not just uh, policy initiatives, but also ASEAN platforms that can be uh, used at the regional level to fully articulate uh, this gender and aging nexus, and specifically older women and the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. And at the same time, leveraging these uh, regional platforms and initiatives to somehow inform uh, the development of policies and programs at the national level. So uh, I think this is the last slide. The next is the thank you slide. So um, this, is, uh, uh, this session is about a uh, discussion on policy responses and um, Maybe we can take a look at, uh, I'm, I'm now looking at the question and answer uh, box to see if there's uh, any burning question that uh, we can uh, address. Yes, we will present, uh, we will share all the slide presentations. Uh, we can confirm that uh, also. I think the, the last uh, question that we can see here is uh, on engaging older women in, in discussions, no? uh, specifically on lockdowns while at the same time addressing their health issues. No? So I think this was already uh, uh, addressed in the previous session. So again, going back to the policy responses, uh, what we have presented uh, are responses, potential responses at the regional level. And maybe moving forward, what we can highlight is that this initiative, this regional forum, is uh, a step forward, uh, building on the regional forum that was conducted last year in Brunei Darussalam, which gave a specific focus on older women and social protection, social welfare. 
And I think just to wrap up this uh, session, uh, what we can look forward to is uh, to look at what specific calls for action uh, that we can uh, gather from this uh, online uh, platform, this online forum, building on the exchange of ideas uh, and suggestions. No? And then see how we can work together under this new normal and just continue to continue have this conversation uh, on highlighting this uh, uh, nexus between gender and aging. So I think with that, uh, I don't see any more uh, questions from the Q&A box and the chat box. Uh, in the next uh, session would be a presentation of the synthesis, just the key takeaway points from uh, this webinar. And I think we have just a couple of minutes left. Uh, I'd like to invite our colleague, Aura, from uh, South Foundation. Aura, you are ready? I'll yes. hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miguel. And thank you, everyone, again, once again, for joining us. Um, this is also a learning experience for us. We learned a lot about this um, forum. Just uh, some of the few takeaways from this um, forum. First, of course, we'd like to highlight that aging, uh, ASEAN is aging fast, and the face of aging in the region is women. And we see this as well in the oldest, even in the oldest age group, those who are 80 years old and above. So we also see that the COVID-19 has continues uh, to wreak havoc in the lives and livelihood around the world, including this, this region. And it affects some population groups more than the others. And men and women are affected differently. But the striking difference as well is on the death rates of the men and the devastating economic and social cost of, on women. So people in vulnerable situations, such as older persons, are disproportionately affected by the outbreak because of their health and overall um, social economic circumstances. This has been highlighted by our two panelists. And then the virus would um, fear to come uh, higher death rates among older persons. And what we also see from all these presentations while we discuss all about the impacts is that even we have this we don't have like a full study yet, that we don't really understand yet the full impact of COVID-19. What has been highlighted are the gender inequalities, discrimination, social isolation, and even income, um, economic insecurities across all ages of women that existed even before the pandemic and now being, are now being exacerbated. Um, we identified um, from the presentations, I. Uh, synthesize some of the key issues of women. I highlighted six issues of women, um, particularly of older women. Number one is the increased risk of infection, which is not just among older age group, but because many of the women are in the workforce, we see a lot of retired, uh, retired nurses, retired doctors as well that being asked to go back to work. And then also those in the care institutions. Number two issue is the increase of burden of care, not only of taking care of children, but also grandchild parenting, grandparenting, where older women are also asked to take care of their grandchildren. And their like, and also their husband who has a um, uh, disability. Then number three issue is the loss of livelihood since most of the women depend on informal work. And also older women depend on childhood, uh, on their children's support. And all of these are affected um, during the lockdown. So the loss of livelihood among um, older women has been highlighted as well. Number four issue is the risk of abuse and violence, not just gender-based violence, but also elder abuse, wherein the children of the older persons are the ones that are the common perpetrators. Number five issue is the lack of social protection. We, we saw from Dr. Srinivas a presentation how low of the uh, percentage of the population has social protection, and this is lower among women. Um, so for instance, the coverage of pension among women is very low, and we know for a fact that this is because of the inequalities they experienced when they were younger. We also highlighted another issue, which is a digital divide, wherein many of the older persons do not have access to internet where most of the information and also engagement are available. So this is all particularly 
are difficult for those who are living in the geographically isolated areas. And last issue is the ageism and discrimination, which is more common and which was exposed and also um, exacerbated by this uh, pandemic. So we saw that women's disadvantage is a main result of the discrimination they have experienced throughout their life. And it was highlighted as well how intersectionality of all of these issues put some groups at particular risk than the others. But fortunately, um, what the, the region has been, uh, CN has been so active in addressing this. In particular, ASEAN mechanisms are actively engaged in ensuring the enjoyment of rights of women and older persons. We can see this in a lot of the digital blueprints and frameworks such as the AC, IAS uh, CC blueprint, the ASEAN strategic framework on social welfare development, ASEAN vision 2025, and also the Kuala Lumpur Declaration on Aging, wherein even in the Declaration of Aging, um, gender mainstreaming through gender disaggregation is also part of the commitments. Specifically in all the women, the ASEAN both, um, Committee on Women, through the regional forum that was held last year, already looked into the, some of these issues that we already talked about and made some recommendations and actions to move things forward. But the main challenge in the CN level, I think, um, uh, which we need to further discuss in how we can turn all the blueprints and all these action points in the country level. Um, and which means also passage of respected domestic laws and provision of budgets to by each member state. Um, in the wake of COVID, uh, we saw how also different uh, and pro disproportionate impacts to women and older persons. But ASEAN also recognizes the detrimental effects of this and also urges stakeholders to integrate their focus on older persons, not just as recipient, but also provi um, providers of care and community service. Lastly, um, I think we saw how member states also uh, put more programs, like immediately put up social protection and stimulus package, expanded it as well to informal economy and provided emergency relief, which are some are new, some are just expansion, and some are just one-off. And we saw as well from the discussions how UN women, I have, and UN agencies in particular provided technical support to member states, sharing good practices, evidence-based advocacy, immediate relief, and even linking the government and civil society. And meanwhile, the civil society, they acted three roles during this pandemic as advocates, representatives, catalysts, and as well as watchdogs. The main challenge is still on the shrinking civil society space, but we know when, when people are working together, like women and older persons working together, we see a lot of issue, um, results as well. So overall, um, there's a commitment to develop continuity plans and measures that are disability inclusive, gender responsive, age sensitivity, specifically on the areas of um, integrating gender and aging in COVID-19. But in the long term, I, um, what is highlighted in the presentations are we still need to work on number one, making a society for all ages, because we know today's youth will be tomorrow's older persons, and in removal of ageism and discrimination. Number two is on working on income security and support through social protection, like closing the coverage gap of women through non-contributory system or pensions, and removing gender bias in the pension system. Continue education, decent work, and social protection, but recognizing the triple roles of women and also putting some balance, mindful about not leading this to commodification of care, the, uh, in this uh, female labor force, and also development of long term care, which includes providing unpaid care work and professionalization of care work. Um, overall, um, we saw how important life force approach to gender equality and the need for some paradigm shift of looking to older persons, not just as recipients or not just as vulnerable groups, but also resources to respond and recovery. And we hope the strong collaborations among member states, together with UN agencies and also civil society, we can build a resilient uh, region that promotes and protects the rights of women of all ages and will leave no one behind. I think that's all, and thank you again. Thank you very much, Aura. 
uh, for that uh, synthesis and sharing of the key points. So we will be writing it down and sharing to all the uh, participants of this forum. So now I hand over the microphone to our colleague from Health Age International, Mr. Eduardo, to close this uh, regional forum. Eduardo, please. Uh, thank you, Miguel. I'll, while, while I was listening, I was typing uh, some, some, some slides that I'm going to share now. Can you see them? As a way to conclude, you know, it's difficult to summarize in a way the, the richness of this, uh, this conversation and Aura has done a brilliant uh, job highlighting the key points. But let COVID not take all the oxygen in the room. Why do I say that? I mean, we cannot lose sight of all the, of the multiplicity of structural systemic disadvantages of women in general and older women in particular in all our societies. And those accumulated disadvantages of older women are accentuated by COVID-19. It's not that they start with COVID-19. And we also have another parallel process, which is aging populations. If we're talking about older women, we are talking of, of population aging as, as the key, key process, which is defined in the 21st century. It's rapidly changing the way our societies behave, our economies perform, our behaviors uh, are maintained. So adapting to population aging is a key priority for all countries in, in, in this region and globally. And it requires systematically understanding of equity in all spheres of life. So no society can be fair, can be equitable, or can be sustainable if it doesn't have gender equity at, as, at its core. Now, a few key areas in rethinking societies, in redesigning societies, and mind you, we're redesigning societies, we're redesigning the plane while flying, and sometimes flying with one engine failing, which is uh, COVID, no? But we have to think of the legal rights, and I think ASEAN is doing quite well in establishing all the, the framework for building these equitable societies. And we have to ensure one key element, which is income security, not only enabling women to work through life, enabling social protection for older women, and enabling pensions, both contributory and non-contributory pensions, to be uh, adding to the income security of women, and especially older women uh, throughout the region and globally. But women cannot work through life and therefore cannot acquire equitable contributory pensions if there are no long-term care strategies in place. Now, countries in this region, because largely because of that lack, huge lack of uh, long-term care strategies and facilities are having total fertility rates which are well below replacement rates. So populations are decreasing, workforces are decreasing. So the structural challenges are multiplied in this in these processes. So long-term care strategies is also a human way of supporting those reduced families in care, taking care of children and allowing women, freeing women to join the workforce and join in full equitable conditions, the, the access to pensions and social pensions. And this is a task finally for all societies. It's not only ASEAN, it's not only the UN, it's not only civil society, it's older women themselves, it's women and men themselves, and uh, it is, I would say, one of the most pressing issues that we have facing ahead of us. Not only overcome COVID in the immediate year to years, but also overcome that structural inequity while at the same time adapting to aging societies. Well, having said all that, I want to thank you all for this joining this event that was co-organized with ASEAN and SAO Foundation. And we will continue processing the documents related to all the wealth of interventions you have made. Thank you very much and have a good day.